Hi, everyone. This is Jason Barrick of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. He's worked in the financial industry for decades. He's written articles for Miles Franklin about the global economy and the gold and silver markets in the past. He now works with Mr. Gold, Jim Sinclair at JS Mindset in a collaboration. Bill Holter, thank you for joining me again. Thanks for having me back, Jason. Now, Bill, I want to ask you about your opinions of President Trump. Has he done anything you like so far? Uh, well, obviously, his appointee to the Supreme Court, uh, I would just generally say a move back toward the rule of law. I mean, we, we were moving so far away from the rule of law, and it does look as if, uh, I mean, he's obviously pestered day after day by the media. Yeah. But his actions, uh, you know, I, I really want to see, uh, I want to see some people go to jail. There's, there's, I mean, Hillary's a perfect example. She belongs in jail. I, I completely mean, agree. Facilitating the sale of uh, Uranium One, that's 20% of the uh, U.S. uranium supply, uh, the monies that went into her her foundation. I mean, just follow the rule of law. Yeah, I, I think he has a lot to clean up in his Department of Justice. There's been just endless corruption there during the Obama administration. He fired James Comey, which I think is good. But you're talking about throwing people in jail. I think Comey should be in jail, too. Not getting, you know, six or seven figure book deals that are going to come along the lines that can bash Trump further. Uh, I agree about the pro-Constitution Supreme Court judge. That looks good to me. Uh, no TPP looks good, but he didn't fall through on his promises to eliminate NAFTA. So that's not good. I think Trump's a mixed bag, uh, and he's been very unpredictable for uh, the media. He's got them, you know, ch- kind of like the dog, where uh, you can get the dog, to, uh, it, your dog, your pet dog, to stop doing whatever uh, you want if you have the right toy or treat, uh, and you throw throw them for fetch. I think Trump's been doing that with the media for a while. I think he's been trolling the media. <laughs> it's actually yeah. it's actually comical. Uh, one thing that he's done that I think is a big, huge mistake, and it's going to come back and, and really be harmful, uh, he has taken uh, basically the rally in the stock market, in the financial markets since the election. He's taken credit for that. And when this thing turns and rolls over and collapses, he owns it now. I mean, he should have been distancing himself uh, I mean, you heard him when he was campaigning that this is a bubble ready to pop, and he should have continued with that because that is the, that's the fact. And he could have distanced himself, but he didn't. He's taken taken credit, and whether that's ego or not uh, doesn't really matter because he owns it. I completely agree. I think it's hubris on his part. Yeah, nine months ago, what was it during one of the debates he was saying, and, and in his tweets and social media, he was repeatedly saying the rhetoric that people like you and me would agree with that, you know, Janet Yellen's manipulating interest rates, the stock market's a bubble, and yet here he is now talking about how many jobs the economy is creating, even though they're probably part-time jobs, if they're not, uh, you know, totally fictional jobs by the birth death model, and then taking right. credit for the stock market rally. So yeah, he's, he's, Setting, I, I don't know if he realizes this, Bill, but he's setting himself up to be the perfect bag holder for, you know, when Janet Yellen and Mario Draghi do leave their uh, positions and then the next global financial crisis happens soon after that. Well, he has already set himself up for it. He owns it. He is the owner now. Do, do you think then that Janet Yellen and Mario Draghi will both be leaving early in 2018 before the uh, before the uh, bubble burst, kind of like how Ben Bernanke got out uh, before and Alan Greenspan got out before the housing bubble? Uh, that's hard to say. I mean, you could wake up Monday morning and, and the things start to burst. It's there's there's no guarantees that we're going to make it to 2018 uh, with a financial system intact. Yeah, that's I mean, it. we should have collapsed several years ago, and this thing has been held together with smoke, mirrors, lies, uh, you know, derivatives to, to uh, basically paint and paint the picture and control all markets. Now, whether they can hold, you know, hold it together through the rest of this year, I don't know. Yeah, you had a great discussion with Lynette Zhang. I'll put the link to that uh, interview. I watched it last night uh, in pre-research for this interview, you're talking about the rules changes. And I think, you know, that's why they've been able to keep this thing going a lot, a uh, lot longer than people with rational knowledge of markets like you and me expected is because they have been changing the rules. So there's been, you know, backdoor bailouts with the oil companies, 
Uh, you have, you know, central banks uh, drastically increasing their balance sheets, really without telling anyone, sometimes not even releasing the information publicly. You have things like currency swaps. So, you know, if well, the Jason, mm-hmm. the, the Fed, uh, it was discovered in 2010 that the Fed lent out, what was it, $16 trillion or $17 trillion all over the world and more than 50% of it to foreign banks back in late 2008, early 2009. Exact, exactly. I, I actually... Huge. That is that is just enormous. And they did that clandestinely, and they were caught after the fact, and it's no big deal. I just put, I just uh, sent it just before we started our call, uh, sent my, my latest writing uh, to post for subscribers, and, and I do talk about the changes in the rules. I mean, mark to market, that was a big one. It's They changed it to, to basically mark to fantasy, mark to maturity. Uh, the Fed really cannot taper. They're talking about tapering. Um, if they truly did taper, that will implode the system. But if you look at the composition of their balance sheet, they're probably, what, uh, 40 45% treasuries and 40 45% mortgage-backed securities. That mortgage-backed security portion, those, those were the, the crappy holdings that banks wanted off of their books. They didn't give them, they did, they did not give the Fed their, their good mortgage backs. They gave them their busted mortgage backs. So the Fed is still probably, uh, sitting on a steaming pile of defaults. There's, there must be a huge amount of defaults already. And we don't know about it because it's it's underneath the Fed's uh, dress or whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's behind the curtain. They, they were yeah. given <laughs> Fed by the fact that they they were defaults because if any of those bonds traded, I mean, go back to what was it, 2000, I think it was 2009, uh, Merrill was leading a syndicate for a... Uh, for an auction, and it turned out that the best bids were at 11 cents, so the auction was canceled. But if that auction had gone through, then uh, banks that had those tranches or, or similar tranches would have had to mark their their portfolios down, and that would have created insolvency across the board. Yeah, but that, it was hidden. It, exactly. There's so many hidden backdoor bailouts right now that the, they're not releasing in public. To add to your points there, I mean, I know I've heard stories, and there's a lot of articles about this, about defaulted loans in China that a lot of the state-owned private Chinese bank, well, they're technically private, but the Chinese government and People's Bank of China backs them, and they haven't called in the loans, and there's 90% default rates, I've heard, on a lot of them, you know, trillions of dollars. Right. And then the there's, you know, rules changes with uh, whether you can get a car loan. So, you know, they've lowered the the lending standards for the last few years just to move more metal off the lot because the car industry right. produced too many cars and had to get rid of them. They'd rather dump them, you know, on, on, on people who can't make the payments and repossess them later. And same thing with real estate. So and and then the oil market, the oil market bill. I know you, you used to live in Texas. Not sure where you live now. The oil market. I, I mean, I still Oh, uh, you still live in Texas? Yeah. I mean, there was a story on Zero Hedge right last year, the year before, uh, about uh, an inside source that the Zero Hedge had, and the Dallas Fed was denying it, how the Dallas Fed told all the banks in Oklahoma and Texas not to bankrupt the oil companies. Well, oil is a double-edged sword. I mean, if the price of oil goes up, it's a, a tax, if you want, on consumers. Uh, it's a, it will uh, act to slow the economy. Lower prices, on the other hand, you know, people are spending less on gas, less on energy, et cetera. But then you've got the, the several trillion dollars of debt outstanding to the energy industry. And I don't know what the number is, but I would suspect if we saw uh, 35 or $30 or lower for six or eight months or more, you would definitely see some defaults. So, you know, it's an interesting, uh, the price of oil is, is like, like I said, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, it's going up is good and bad and going down is good and bad. Yeah, so the oil needs a Goldilocks price. It can't be too high or too low or it'll cause immense and, damage. Yeah. And you just mentioned China. Uh, remember, there's, what is it, six and a half or seven trillion dollars in their shadow banking system. And what you were just talking about, uh, if, if that's true that they have 90% default rates in in one sector that are not being defaulted or, or called in. Uh, I mean, the shadow banking system, that's so dangerous. And I think China is so much more leveraged than the average person 
perceives. Yeah, and no one's really talking about that. It, well, some hedge fund managers are, but the mainstream financial media isn't really talking about it that much. The Bank of Japan's balance sheet bill is about the size of their GDP now, but yet we have people like Janet Yellen going on TV in the last couple of weeks and saying, you know, that there's going to be no financial crises in our lifetimes. Why do you think she would say something like that? Uh, I have no idea. All I can <laughs> say is famous last words of a fool. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking she's saying that so the markets don't crash before she can leave the position and, you know, go back to academia or start consulting for hedge funds for six or seven figure uh, fees like Bernanke or get her six or seven figure book deals. Yeah, I, I really I, I the day she said that the following day, I wrote a wrote an article on that. I mean, it makes absolutely zero sense because, I mean, she she has to know what's going on behind the scenes. She obviously knows what's going on behind the scenes, and she knows that on a daily basis, all the markets are being uh, painted, supported, suppressed in order for the, the picture to, to look right. And she's got to know that it's taking more and more force to do that every single day. I completely agree. It's the law of diminishing returns now for the central bankers. You know, what she said, Bill, it reminds me in the past of what Irving Fisher said prior to the October 1929 stock market crash, exactly. that stocks had reached a permanently high plateau. It also reminds right. me of, you know, what Ben Bernanke was going out and saying before he became chairman of the Federal Reserve in interviews from 2005 to 2007, how subprime was contained, the economy was strong, and justified higher housing prices. Well, he also said that, you know, we'd never, uh, the Great Depression could never happen again because we have a thing called the printing press. And yet he won Times Man of the Year, right, after the crisis for quote-unquote saving us. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Welcome to Dystopia, right? He he caused him and his buddies, his uh, PhD Keynesian economists at the central banks caused the crisis, and then they get the awards for and the uh, all the extra uh, money that comes along with it for supposedly saving us, <laughs> too. Well, the bottom line, Jason, is that nothing was fixed after 2008. Nothing was changed. Nothing was fixed. Everything was papered over. What caused the problem, too much debt, was the solution, creating more debt to paper the problems over. So what they've done is they've set this system up for 2008, to happen all over again, but with multiples of of force. So we're I, we're we are set up uh, for 2008 to happen again. Uh, but this time there are no central banks and there are no sovereign treasuries with the ability to reflate. That's what we missed. That's what we missed in 2008 was that the central banks and the sovereign treasuries would bankrupt themselves to try to save the banking system. But there is no entity now uh, with the ability to step in at, during a crisis and save the system. This time it's going to go full blown and, you know, you will, you will see cross defaults across the board. Yeah, I interviewed Ron Paul a couple months ago in May and he said it's inevitable that there's going to be a new global financial system. It's going to be a reset, but I don't think anyone, uh, whether it's Jim Rickards or anyone else who has the contacts at the highest level knows what the next system is going to look like. Uh, I would imagine there is somebody out there. There are some out there that on the inside that know what they're they're wanting to move toward. It may be the SDR. Who knows? I mean, I I don't know. Uh, but I do know that mathematically the system as is is untenable and it's going to come down. Yeah, and you know, it's just really funny hearing central banks talking about central bankers talking about recovery, how well the economy is doing, and yet central bankers have 18 trillion in assets that either through currency pegs or just creating money out of thin air with cheap money and credit that they've created. So, you know, the Bank of Japan, they have their balance sheet is about the size of their GDP now. The Bank of England has over 3 trillion in assets. Uh the Swiss central bank owns 80 billion in technology stocks. They're essentially right. a hedge fund. <laughs> Well, the central bank uh, one point into uh, into markets in the first five months of the year. I mean, that's three hundred billion dollars a month. It's seventy five billion dollars a week. Yeah, it's just enormous. And then they tell us everything's right, but if they took the money out or interest rates started going up, you know, there would be a big crash pretty quickly after that, probably. Now, I, I want to transition to g the gold and silver markets. I want to ask you about sentiment, since you've worked for uh, with bullion dealers in the past, and you also write a popular column that people are allowed to comment on. Uh, do you think the sentiment levels for gold, silver, and mining shares, especially in the United States, are the worst you've seen uh, in a long time? 
this is probably uh, the most downtrodden uh, gold and silver people have ever been. I mean, the sentiment, just judging from my uh, my emails, the emails uh, Jim gets from, from people, people are really beaten down, downtrodden, uh, to the point of giving up and saying, well, it's just never going to happen. And people have forgotten why, why they bought gold and silver in the first place. They did that to get out of the system. So yeah, the sentiment is bad. And you can look at the, uh, assuming that the COT numbers are correct, and maybe you shouldn't assume that, but it does look like speculators are now short and the commercials are, are as small short as they've been in, in years. So from that standpoint, uh, you, you may be seeing this thing turning right now. I can tell you, uh, precious metals dealers, uh, there have been several that have, have gone out of business. Uh, business is extremely slow. Uh, from a, from a personal standpoint, that's not been the case. I've had a, I broker, uh, gold and silver and I've had a, a fabulous year, but, uh, it, it definitely, uh, macro wise has been, been a slow year. Yeah. To add to your points there, I mean, U.S. Gold Eagle sales are down a lot. I, I think it's really mostly the U.S. where, uh, the retail investor for gold, silver mining shares, the demand for physical precious metals is down a lot. But the numbers, Bill, out of India and China for go- physical gold and are silver huge. are still very strong. I saw that. Hmm? Yeah. I saw that. India is importing, uh, lots of gold, lots of silver. Uh, China's back on board importing importing gold. Um, and actually, I think the first I think I saw something the first 12 days of uh, July, there were more uh, silver eagle sales than all of the month of June. So maybe that's starting to turn. I, I also think, Bill, that the, a lot of silver miners, the largest ones, are realizing they can't really grow uh, their silver production anymore, and they're diversifying out of the silver business. I'm not sure if you noticed this as well, but a lot of the larger silver miners are buying gold mines because there's more available that are economic, and uh, it's just e- an easier business to be a gold miner than it is to be a primary silver miner. And then we have you know large companies like Silver Wheaton and Silver Silver Standard, you know, they they have diversified out of silver business because it's so tough to find economic silver investments now that they've bought gold investments for the last couple of years and now they've changed their names away from silver. So I think that shows, you know, from a sentiment perspective that, you know, things are bearish, have been bearish for a while and that, you know, we're kind of getting close to a bottom. I think we're, I did a short video on this earlier in the week, not sure if you saw it, but, you know, we're at a silver price now below 16 where at least 30 million ounces from primary silver miners is not really economic anymore. So, uh, you know... Plus you you just had, uh, what, 21 million ounces go off the board with Tahoe Resources down in, uh, uh, was it Mexico? I forget what country they're in. Guatemala. Uh, Guatemala, that's right. Um, yeah, so there, that's, that's 20 million ounces that's in limbo and not being produced. And the base metal miners that mine silver as a byproduct, th- those guys have the base metal prices are not doing well either. Their balance sheets are bad. So who knows how much longer those guys can keep producing, you know, record amounts of uh, silver byproduct production as well. Well, the question really is how long can the paper markets uh, subvert pricing versus real supply and real real demand? That is that is an excellent question. You know, That's if the this, question. Well, if, if silver had, let's say, gotten below 15, I think there was going to be, uh, if that had stayed down there for a couple quarters, there was going to be some miners that were going to have to make, some primary silver miners that were going to have to make some very difficult decisions about what to do with their uh, higher cost mines. Well, they still do. I mean, even at this level, at $16, I mean, it's just not... There's not much meat on this bone. I agree. And almost all the new silver mines, Bill, except for Mag Silver's enormous new silver mine in Mexico, and they're not a normal junior because their partner is Fresnillo, the largest sil- primary silver miner right. in the world. Yeah, so almost all the new potential silver mines that I've looked at, they need 25, 30 silver to even think about being built. So I don't, I don't know how this is sustainable where uh, they're pulling so much silver out of the ground and how the reserves are going to be replaced. Well, then you bring up reserves. I mean, how much how much money has been put into exploration over the last five years or last ten years? Very little. So that tells you for the next five or ten years. I mean, there's no big big projects coming on anywhere. 
Well, th yeah, there's just the Mag Silver one, but that's the exception to the rule because they're not a normal junior. But yeah, other than that, I totally agree with you. There's just really not any economic ones. It's it's really interesting, and the a lot of the primary silver miners, you know, they're not Polish silver. I think you know they. I, I think a lot of them don't understand the supply demand, the real supply demand fundamentals of silver. I think if you would have asked a lot of their CEOs, they would have wished they would have hedged silver at a much higher price. Well. I what we were just talking about, the supply and demand, I mean, the supply is not going to be there at a time that demand is going to explode. And plus, you've got all these paper contracts outstanding with people, uh, or, or not just paper contracts, but paper uh, paper programs, if you want to call it that, people who believe they own gold and believe they own silver, what are they going to do when they find out they don't own it? I mean, they become buyers again. Sure. Or, or the COMEX with, with buys them out for cash, right? <laughs> the COMEX pays them off. <laughs> No, it's going to be interesting. Uh, now, speaking of the COMEX, you know, because the COMEX is actually, uh, instead of getting people their metal, they've actually overpaid them with 80% uh, premiums in the past when there was acute supply shortages. I want to ask you about the comments of the CME Group CEO a couple days ago on Fox Business. He said he was, was shocked. shocked. I was well, shocked when I heard that. I, I, I couldn't believe the question was asked. Then after the question was asked, I could not believe. Uh, what did he come out with? Uh, three, four, five thousand dollar gold? I think he said five or six thousand gold. He five said, or six thousand? Okay. Yeah. yeah it, would just, it blew my mind. I mean, I, this is the head of the CME talking about it. So um, the question in my mind is then why is the price where it is? I mean, he obviously knows. He knows what the game is. Uh, it was it, it, right... After I, I heard that, I said to myself, well, he's on the record now, so he can say, well, we warned you. I actually have a friend who was in a room uh, at a conference that Gary Gensler, the former head of the CFTC, was speaking at. It was a regular investing conference. And so Gensler actually admitted before he left to go be Hillary Clinton's campaign finance manager in 2016, he admitted that gold and silver were f fully manipulated. But his excuse was, you know, the normal bureaucrat excuse that we don't have the money or time or resources, manpower to go and stop the manipulation. Well, I've got one word. To, to reply to that. That is bullshit. I apologize for cussing on your show, but all they have to do is, for instance, last Friday when 50, 50 million ounces of silver hit the market in one minute, just follow that trade. Who was the broker? Then ask the broker who was the client. I mean, you don't have to have millions of dollars to do that. One person could track that down. One person could track that down within 24 hours. One person with the, the examination power could track that down within 24 hours and point the finger and say, cease and desist, you're fined, you're out of business. Uh, I mean, that's just, that is so wrong. We don't have the money to do it. That's just... That's, like I said, it's bullshit. Well, welcome to Dystopia. That's the normal excuse bureaucrats give, though. And uh, if you remember Bart Chilton, he, you know, would do the song and dance saying how gold and silver were manipulated. And yet here he is now working to lobby for the benefit of high frequency trading uh, the industry after he right. went on TV all the time saying it was manipulating markets. So it's it's just crazy how things are. But, you know, I think this goes back to your uh, points earlier about the rule of law. You know, if they did actually prosecute either one and investment banker or one investment banking firm or one hedge fund manager for manipulating gold and silver, you know, with that silver flash crash, it would send a message, not just with fines, but, you know, actual charges of uh, RICO corruption, manipulating right. markets, all these things. Jail time. Yes, yes. Legit yeah, jail time. People will respect jail time and you would see the shenanigans stop immediately. I mean, the rule of law literally will crash the system because it would, if the rule of law took over, all of the, the lies, all of the fraud would be uncovered. And I think people would be absolutely shocked to know, uh, how fake everything, how fake our lives are at this point. I, I completely agree. Bill, as you know, I live right outside of Washington, D.C., 15, 20 minutes. I have people working at different levels of government agencies, good, honest people, people listen to this podcast who are fed up with the way the system is, bring me stories off the record. They don't want to risk their jobs and their careers telling me stories about just endless amounts of corruption pervasive throughout pretty much every single government agency you can think of with either phony government contracts or being, uh, you know, uh, being told to ignore crimes, uh, felonies, and things like that. Well, uh, we were supposed to have four years of Hillary. And with four years of Hillary, all of the last eight years, the crimes, the fraud, etc., would have been swept under the rug. You know, no, no telling where we would be right now. Well, I, I you think and I would probably be 
uh, muzzled already. Or in jail. Yeah, she. W- I heard that Hillary uh, planned to go after like Matt Drudge and Alex Jones and uh, you know the people uh, who are viewed as either uh, moderate or conservative, uh, the news people. She was going to shut their down their websites or throw them in prison. Right, shut down the truth. Well, I, I want to ask you before I let you go about the Jim Sinclair quote. You know, he said something years ago. Uh, obviously, his gold and silver predictions uh, in the past have been wrong uh, about prices gold and silver will go to in the short term. But he said this amazing quote, and I think it's playing out true now. He said that the retail investors would give up and that the people who are manipulating gold and silver would cover their shorts and they were the ones who would get rich when gold and silver finally rose. Uh, do, do you think then he's going to end up being proven right uh, going forward? Yeah, for the most part. I mean, you can see it. There's The speculators are giving up. The, the gold community is is giving up. Uh, and it, it just makes sense that, that those on the inside that have been uh, suppressing gold and silver, when they take their thumb off of that, they're going to be long. And those are the ones who are going to make enormous amounts of, of capital. So so do you, do you think then that that's why the CME group guy would say something like that? Because, you know, him and the J.P. Morgan shorts guys, they know that they're, they've covered a lot of their shorts and they're starting, they've already built up, you know, their physical metal or their mining share positions and they've already got things long. So they don't care at this point because they've gotten out of their, uh, their damaging short positions and they're already set up for the price rise? Yeah, I think they've been been building physical for years. And like I said before, I really believe uh, that question would not have been asked if it wasn't allowed to be asked. And I I just have to believe that uh, he said what he said so that he's now on the record and he can say, hey, you know, I warned you. I talked about $5,000 gold. Yeah, he's he's the CEO of a multi-billion dollar company and having dealt with some CEOs of companies that big, they normally want to see every single question uh, beforehand before they agree to do an interview like that. Well, and he probably planted that question. That's that's my point. The question would not have been asked if he didn't want it asked. We, we live in very interesting times now, don't we, where, uh, you know, the rules change so quickly and there's little snippets of truth hidden among a lot of lies and propaganda on the mainstream media? Uh, yeah, you, you get snippets of truth, but the, the main uh, the main line, I mean, it's it's all a lie. Well, uh, Bill, uh, I want to thank you again for your time today. Oh, uh, last question, actually, about Bitcoin. Do, do you think, then, that uh, the people in power are going to continue to allow these cryptocurrencies to rise, or do you think they're going to change the rules, then, on Bitcoin and Ethereum on the, the tax consequences or figure out a way to sabotage these things? Well, it won't surprise me. I mean, obviously, they're... There is this, you know, the New World Order wants a one world currency. And, I mean, even even in the Bible, the mark of the beast, uh, in order to transact business. In today's world, that would be some type of cryptocurrency. So I, I will not surprise me to see us living in a cryptocurrency world in the future. Now, which crypto? Is it even in existence yet? I don't know. Uh and I can tell you, if, if governments want to shut the cryptocurrencies down, they'll shut it. They'll shut them down one way or the other. They're already talking about uh, any movements of over ten thousand dollars that you don't report uh, would be punishable by jail time and forfeiture of other assets. So yeah, I mean, governments can uh, they can and and very likely will step in. Uh, what they're taking away, I I don't really know. I don't really get it. Uh, you know, maybe I'm an idiot, but I. I view these cryptocurrencies as just another fiat currency. It's digital air. I mean, there's there's nothing behind any uh, digital currency, just like there's nothing behind any uh, paper slash you know digital currency in the banking system. They're not real. So, uh, in in my opinion, I don't think governments can shut down these blockchains uh, without shutting down the internet. So, and they don't want to shut down the internet because that would totally collapse the economy and that would stop all pretenses and that the economy is recovering. But what they can do is, you know, they could create rules, regulations, taxes, and tax uh, people have made, you know, lots of money off trading these uh, cryptocurrencies to the point where, you know, they make them criminals. And basically right, then... Put people in jail. Yeah. Put some people in jail and then watch what happens. Well, you, you brought up that point there where I think now uh, they're talking about... Th- this is being proposed by, I think, even Republican congressmen that you, uh, if you cross a U.S. border and go to another country, if you own ten thousand dollars or more worth of Bitcoin or Ethereum, you'd have to declare it at the at the border. It's kind of right. it's I, this isn't a law yet, but it's being proposed. This is crazy talk right now, in my opinion. 
as a libertarian, well, this is crazy that they're getting to this. I was just about to say uh, it's pretty destructive to the word liberty. There is no liberty. But uh, yeah, I mean, the the uh, cryptocurrencies, what they can do, Bill, is since the uh, blockchain like Bitcoin is open source, they can actually take the code, copy and paste it, uh, the code, and just make their own government digital backed currency and that would fit into a cashless society plan for government and they could force people out of cash then so ban actual currency you know dollars paying for cash uh when you go to the restaurant or movie theater or whatever and right. force people into government currency i actually i was at a blockchain conference in march and i know two governments are actually working on that canada is actually testing it already and so and india is talking about doing it well nothing Nothing would surprise me when it comes to suppressing uh, the liberty of the people at this point. I mean, governments have gotten out of hand. They're not getting out of hand. They've gotten out of hand. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, who who would have thought that the central bankers would have added $18 trillion to their balance sheets? If you would have told, uh, like, almost any expert that during the 2008 financial crisis, they probably would have told you that all the currencies – would have high, all the major currencies like the dollar, the Japanese yen would have hyperinflated. Right. Yeah. If you knew now, if you knew then what you knew now, you would you would without a doubt say, oh, well, they're going to hyperinflate the currencies. The currencies are all going to go away. And the, the way they've been able to keep that under control and keep markets under control is via derivatives. You know, you put a dollar down and, and control a hundred dollars and that dollar down is free because you print it. I also think it's it's uh, what Jim Sinclair said in the past, Bill, MOPE, or Management of Perception Economics. So if you're just a regular business person, and yes, you're not getting any money on your checking account, but your real estate portfolio is going up, your bond right. investments are going up, your stock portfolio is doing well, you're not really going to care that you know the currency is being inflated that much. Okay, maybe your regular everyday bills are going up a little bit, but all the assets you own are doing really well, so you're not really going to care that the currencies are being drastically devalued for your asset prices to go sky high. They did the same thing in Rome, didn't they? They provided uh, bread and circuses. <laughs> you know, they kept well, the population. They, they kept the population tame. Well, they they also put the military and the government employees who are aware that the current uh, closest that their salaries were being destroyed the most. They put them back on the gold standard the fastest. So they right. kept, you know, the they kept the uh, in this case now would be the big government in D.C. and the bureaucrats and uh, Wall Street people, the bankers. They kept those main two main groups uh, happy. And while the rest of the people did uh, a lot worse every year, that's what they're doing. Well, uh, you know, uh, I, I wish things were, were, were looking better, but uh, we're in a very difficult situation right now. And uh, I really commend you, Bill, for going out there and uh, highlighting this for a lot of people, all the different problems that are going on. But, uh, you know, people, I, I think it's a dangerous environment for people to be all in on gold and silver. I think people should have dollars in case there's a crash so they can buy up some assets. And uh, I also like Bitcoin for speculation uh, purposes because, uh, yes, it is, it is digital, but it's also not manipulated like gold and silver are. So uh, I, I think it's a good diversification tool for people who have cash and, and gold and silver. Well, we'll have to agree to disagree on the crypto part. And I think uh, as far as cash is concerned, the only cash I would recommend people have uh, would be physical cash that'll probably work for only two or three weeks after the banking system comes down. And actually, the, I think dollar bills will probably strengthen during that uh, two, three, four week period of time because there won't be many on the streets, so they will demand a premium until people figure out, hey, I'm accepting a piece of paper for something real. And to, I actually want to ask you a question. Uh, you're saying you think it'd be a good idea to hold cash. Where would you hold cash? Other than a direct treasury bill, where could you possibly hold cash in this system in and a have it be safe? In, in a safe with, uh, with lead bullion. <laughs> Well, let's say you have a quarter of a million dollars sitting in your safe and you're talking about buying up cheap assets. Do you really believe the dollar is going to survive on the other on the other side of this? Uh, I, I think based on based on my conversations with different people, I've interviewed a lot of experts such as yourself, Jim Rickers, many other people. I, I I think they want the SDR, but I also think they're also prepared to just reissue like a new dollar that's devalued a lot, maybe against gold or something. So where they I devalue can, the dollar fifty percent against I gold, can make the gold an inside and outside dollar. Yeah, that's a dollar that's for trade kind of, and a dollar, you know, for Americans to use. Yeah, that's kind of what happened after. Uh, 
after uh, Bretton Woods, how gold was not allowed for U.S. citizens, but uh, there was a foreign gold exchange standard, maybe something along those lines, but with a devalued dollar, though. Well, we'll agree on the devalued dollar, and I think your 50% number may be a little light. Well, they, they may do multiple, but yeah, I think they'd, I don't know if they'd do, a, do like 80% devaluation overnight. They may do multiple, but uh, yeah, I think that's the way from reading central bankers' white papers and, and uh, people who have spoken with central bankers, I think that's kind of the direction they want to go. But uh, I enjoyed our conversation today, Bill, and uh, if our listeners want to follow more of your work, how do they do so? Uh, you can go to JS mindset.com it's j-s-m-i-n-e-s-e-t.com uh jim and i do a weekly interview and i write two or three times a week uh for subscribers and then there's the the public side where we just put articles up uh and put comments articles that we think are of interest or important wall street for main street needs your help YouTube stole $7,200 from Wall Street for Main Street in annualized YouTube AdWords revenues, and they kneecapped our analytics down by more than 80% across the board since September 2016 with their new censorship algorithms to stop the rapid growth of our channel. That was money we could have used to upgrade our website, pay bills, and invest in improving our content and growing our business. Our audience of loyal listeners is all over the globe and so large now that if most or all of our listeners were to commit to donating $1 to $5 each month to our Patreon account, we could easily meet our goal on Patreon. Wall Street for Main Street also accepts one-time donations on our main wallstreetformainstreet.com website, that's W-A-L-L-S-T-F-O-R-M-A-I-N-S-T.com website via PayPal, gold money, or Bitcoin. We also accept donations of physical precious metals that can be mailed to us. Thanks to all listeners who have already made a donation, and thanks in advance to any listeners who make a future uh, donation or contribution to the growth, improvement, and success of Wall Street for Main Street.